See if I'm getting a reaction back there. Can you hear okay, Dick? A little bit more? How's that? All right. Uh, let's see. Um, um, well, would you mind uh, leading us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? If you can make it through there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's, uh, bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come before you to meet with our friends and neighbors and join with them in an act of stewardship toward this wonderful nation. Among all others, this nation was born with a recognition of you as our creator and the source of our life and all our liberties. We thank you for this opportunity and ask that you grant us your strength, your perseverance, and your wisdom as we go forth this day. Amen. Let's, uh, let's take 30 seconds to uh, uh, have a moment of silence and remember it's uh, September 11th and that terrible tragedy. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, get started with my else, could I see a show of hands for people who are here for the first time? Yay! Very good, very good. We're glad to have you here. Uh, please be sure to sign our uh, uh, guest register here and give us your email so we can stay in touch with you. Uh, it's one of our primary ways of getting the word out to people. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, able to get uh, hold of people by phone number uh, in the near future. But right now, email is still our primary method. Our secondary method is for people to just look, just look at our website. We try to keep important announcements on that uh, front page of the website that uh, keeps people connected. Uh, we are a conservative grassroots organization and we've been going for almost two years now. We are uh, just short of our second anniversary here. And our method is uh, pretty straightforward. We work to identify fellow conservatives, uh, try to get them interested in what we're doing by putting on breakfasts like this and etc., and uh, inform them at the breakfast, at town hall meetings, at tea parties, etc., of what's going on. And most importantly of all, to get them involved in being part of the solution, uh, giving the silent majority its voice so that we can all make an impact. And uh, Bill, Bill, uh, would you step over here where people can see you? And uh, Homer Smith, could you stand up for a second? Uh huh. These guys are heroes, absolute heroes. Now Bill's been known as the bookmark bookmark guy, and he's handing out bookmarks and pocket constitutions. We've uh, we already pushed uh, 3,500 out the door, thanks to uh, Bill and his. Uh, uh, getting us started in that. A, a major thing is happening with uh, the schools in Medina County this next week, and I'm not talking about Obama trying to invade the classrooms again with another hour of his propaganda. I'm talking about pushing constitution, pocket constitutions, to the kids in government classes, 2,400 copies. And the film... Uh,
and the film A More Perfect Union. These are the two guys that made it happen, so uh, I really appreciate doing that. This is huge. Uh, next year, if we can get the rest of the state to do that, and we could get the rest of the country to do that in 2012, that would be a stunning achievement. So uh, thanks very much. I mean, this, this is an example of what volunteers can do. You can really make a difference. All you gotta do is get the idea and go for it. And that brings us to the fourth, fifth part of what we try to do, enable volunteers to make a difference. We have a big tent here. Uh, latest uh, indications are there's 40% Republican, 30% Democrat, 30% Independents. So we are uh, nonpartisan, but we all are conservatives. And we uh, open up the uh, floor to a variety of views, not, not all of which we share. But even if we don't share those views, uh, we do try to keep it civil. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to introduce the uh, uh, elected officials we have with us. Uh, Dave Hall, state representative from the uh, southern end of uh, Medina County and southward. Uh, Gary Warner, Mayor of Brunswick. Glad to see you again. We had a great door-to-door -door canvassing effort uh, last weekend up in his neck of the woods. There were about 50 people there, I understand, from Sharon Ray. That was a good showing. Uh, speaking of Sharon Ray, County Commissioner, she's here. And Nancy Abbott, our uh, recorder. And, and a tier one voter. Tier one voter. We've been given uh, a uh, database uh, of uh, everybody, all the voters in the 13th and 16th congressional districts that are ranked. Uh, individually, the voters, as well as precincts by what tier they uh, fit into as to voting intensity. Uh, people that always vote, or those who seldom vote. So uh, I, I tested it out and checked for Nancy having church. Now she's a tier one voter. <laughs> All right, uh, did I miss anyone, Nancy? Any other elected officials? Going once, going twice. One, one. Bill. Bill Batchel. Batchel. Well, yeah, but he's the guest speaker. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to introduce Anita Hall. She's the re uh, county recorder for Holmes County. She's with Dave. Oh, very good. Thank you. Okay, and I did see one candidate in the back. Uh, let's see. Well, of course, besides Dave and Bill, who are both running for re-election. Adam Frederick in the back there. And although I personally think his opponent is a clown, we should always take these races seriously and get behind the good guys and make sure they win. Right. All right, uh, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over now to Nancy Abbott for our 10-minute uh, Constitution lesson. <laughs> Oh, by the way, we do have a new speaker system. <laughs> By popular request. <laughs> and how cool is this? There's a podium and everything. A uh, couple things I want to talk about before I talk about the Constitution today. One has to do with the, the walk up in Brunswick last Sunday. It was phenomenal. There were over 50 people out walking for Bill Batchelder, Josh Mandel, and Adam Frederick. And there were a whole slew of people from this group up there walking. So this is, uh, we don't do this too often, but I'm looking around the room. Could you please stand if you walked last Saturday up in Brunswick? Larry and Bill and Jean and Gary in the back. Well, there were a whole pile more there from this group, but I'm really proud of all of you because it shows that you're putting your feet where your mouths or where you I don't know, I'm not real good at those little things like that. You just did a darn good job. And I am going to ask you, your feet, I guess, your feet. No, 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 I don't want to say that. No one did that, you did a good thing. Um, I did. Uh, I'll have one more way that you can volunteer for those of you that are backing John Kasich. We are having a call and call and debate party next Tuesday at our Victory Center at 704 North Court Street. 
come make calls. They're really easy from five to eight. And then we're gonna watch the debate and we'll have pizza and pop. So if you've made calls before or you wanna see what it's like, come on up and make calls. This is something that John Kasich has asked us to do for him uh, next Tuesday, make it a special Tuesday. So come on up, make calls, and have pizza and pop. Yeah. Now on to the Constitution. We're getting close to the end, and we're getting into the 1960s. And I found out, well, I can't see it, but Amendment 24 has to do with actually getting rid of a poll tax. What amazes me is that there was a poll tax in some southern states all the way through the mid-1960s. So in, there was finally, there was an amendment to the Constitution eliminating that poll tax. And I even think there had to be a, there was probably a Supreme Court case after that challenging it and all, you know, poll taxes were out. What I, when I was out Googling some information on it, I found out that this poll tax, everything had to do with the civil rights in the 60s, that the poll tax actually benefited women in the South. Because women, if they didn't own property or they didn't have a job or they didn't have their own money, they could not vote in a lot of the southern states because they could not afford the poll tax. So that particular amendment not only did it affect, you know, help other poor groups, it helped women. So I guess we always think about African Americans and African Americans and civil rights in the 60s. The fact was this benefited women. So it was a good thing. So your grandmothers, your mothers who might have lived in the South might not have been able to vote because they did not have the money for their poll tax. So that was gone in the 60s. And there's a couple notes on it on the back page. And the next one, and it was surprising to me that this country did not have a succession for president. So if something were to happen in the presidency, there was nothing in writing to say, what are we going to do if something happens? And as a result of President Kennedy's death, we have Amendment 25, with if there's an immediate absence of the president in office, or if the president himself or herself decides that for a period of time he or she cannot provide, or provide the services he needs to do, or if, people around him, which is kind of scary, decide that the president can no longer do the services. They can actually, um, actually petition Congress to take him out. So it's an interesting, a very interesting amendment for you to read. There's a little bit on the back in the notes, and it's just something that I'm gonna spend a little more time with. But they're very, two very current amendments here that you should read and read the notes because they're actually very interesting and very current. I want to say something about the constitutions. You know, this all started out of my eighth grade teacher, Sister Mary Ursula, who made us read the constitution when we were in the eighth grade. So I'm really impressed that McFan is going to get the constitutions out to all the seniors in Medina County. So I also want to give a hand to all of you are doing that because that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Because trust me, I had not read the Constitution from the time I was in eighth grade till I started reading it again for this. So I'm hoping, you know, all the kids that are 17 and 18 are going to be a little closer to reading it again. So please read your Constitution. Okay, if you do not have your pocket Constitution, Jim tells me that there's some up here on the front table. Make sure you get a copy of the Constitution and read it. Um, I get my information from usconstitution.net initially, so if you want to go out and read some more from that, it, it, it's just one of many good sources of information on the Constitution. Another good source on the Constitution is the person that's going to be speaking with us a little bit is Representative Bill Batchelder because he and his family sit around at the dinner table discussing the Constitution. So if you really have any questions, you need to ask him um, because he is, has a wealth of knowledge on the Constitution. Now next, in two weeks, we're going to have the last two amendments of the Constitution. So by then, you'll be up to speed on the Constitution. Thank you. Okay.
Uh, we've got a number of announcements at the end, but uh, rather than uh, delay our guest speaker anymore, I'd like to uh, let him go ahead and uh, uh, get started, and uh, we'll, we'll try to cut him off at about uh, 9.40, 9.45, if he's still going. Uh, so we have enough time for all the announcements. It's kind of funny because um, most of the announcements uh, tend to arrive fairly late, like after I get here. <laughs> but that's a good thing. We like to be responsive. Uh, and they're all good announcements. Uh, let me, uh, without stepping on uh, a speech or anything like that, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Usually we like to uh, let our guest speakers have pretty much free reign because they're, uh, they're all expert in an area. They know what's current in that area. They can share their knowledge with us. Or if they're candidates, they're up to, uh, up to speed on their campaign. They know what's next. They know what they need, etc. So we usually give them uh, fairly full reign and don't give us give them much of an introduction. I think uh, Representative Batchelder uh, warrants a little bit more of an introduction. Uh, many of you already know him uh, from your uh, uh, experience in uh, Medina County. Uh, those who uh, are not familiar with him uh, may not appreciate that he's got about 40 years of experience serving Medina County in the legislature and in the judiciary. Uh, and in fact, he has recently returned from the judiciary to be in the uh, Ohio House of Representatives. And if we regain control of the House, we'll become the Speaker of the House this next year. That is a very important position. That is second only to the governor in the power of the state. And that's a vital position if we want to actually turn the direction of Ohio around and start rebuilding our economy and our culture. Uh, John Kasich needs a good conservative Speaker of the House, or he will be very severely limited in what he can accomplish. Uh, so that, there's that. One of the requirements of Bill as Minority Leader he has to make sure that he gets a, uh, all these other people running for state representative elected as well. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with that uh, last primary. I uh, was on the ballot as a state central committee man, and I think I was able to uh, put in about three or four hours on my own campaign. The rest of my time was trying to help these other guys get elected. So I suspect he might be in my same shoes, that he is working really hard to get all these other guys elected, uh, <laughs> and still trying to get himself elected too. So um, I just want to mention that understanding. Uh, the next thing is don't underestimate the importance of this election. Uh, I've been at this for a long while and people always say, oh, this is the most important election ever. They say it every election. So we come to discount it. But you know something, I was there from 1976. 1980 would put Reagan in the White House and the Cold War was ended after that. 1994, we put uh, Gary in the Speaker of the House and the welfare state was uh, reversed because of that. I think this election is more important than either of those two because we've got to slam the brakes on a government that is out of control. We can't wait until 2012. We've got to do it this year. In 2010, they're doing a census. Based upon that sentence, uh, census, we'll have the number of representatives from Ohio determined, and the Ohio House will determine what the boundaries are. So if we throw a bunch of the bums out in 2010, but we don't change the Ohio House of Rep Representatives, the Democratic majority can redraw those boundaries and get all those Democrats back in through gerrymandering. So that's why it's so important that we regain this, uh, the uh, Ohio House of Representatives as well as throw the bums out in Washington. Having used up some of uh, Bill's time, I'd like to go ahead and uh, uh, turn the podium over to Bill. Uh, Bill, uh, you have the uh, con. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here today with patriots. Mm -hmm. It's an honor to be here today with people who care so much about their country that they're willing to work at it instead of watch it on TV. 
it's a wonderful thing to see people here who I know have been out working in campaigns, and I want to thank you for your effort up in Brunswick uh, last week. The mayor was there, I was there, and we wanted to greet uh, Josh Mandel. He finished 100,000 miles traveling the state, and he did it right here in Medina County in front of the Brunswick City Hall. It was a great day. This, uh, this campaign and this election, as I indicated, uh, as, as Jim indicated, is unbelievably important. We can't turn this country around in this election. He had a very good phrase. He said, we can put on the brakes. We can do that at the federal level. At the state level, we can turn it around, and we need to do that. Those who have watched state government in this past two years have to be pretty concerned about its future. And when I went out and started recruiting candidates across the state to run for the House of Representatives, and that I did before we were sworn in even for this session, would be very pleased, each of you, to meet those candidates and to see what they're willing to do. I told one candidate, this state is so messed up, this is a young candidate in the suburbs, this state is so messed up that you may only serve one term because you're going to have to do things to fix it that are going to perhaps be fatal to any political effort that you might have. And that candidate looked me in the eye and said, I'd be proud to do that. That's consistent with the Constitution that you've been looking at. That's consistent with what our founders thought ought to happen in, in the political arena. I just want to mention a few of the candidates, and I appreciate Jim talking about the importance of this race, a few of the candidates that we have around the state. My dear friend Dave Hall, of course, and I share Medina County, but I want you to know how hard he works. I put him on the Finance and Budget Committee. I'm the first minority leader ever to put six freshmen on that committee. Now, why did I do that? They're not afraid. They know what they're doing. They know why they went to Columbus. It isn't until some of these people hang around long enough yeah, that they get to be a problem in terms of cutting to the chase and doing what has to be done. The reason I am the minority leader is because people got sick and tired of the frat boys running our caucus. They wanted somebody who stood on principle. When I ran Ronald Reagan's campaign in Ohio in 76 and 80 through the primaries, I had a privilege of working for a man that I was totally supportive of because I knew what he could do. The greatest president of the 20th century, Ronald Reagan. What a privilege and an honor that was. And of course, the regular Republican Party at that point was trying to get Gerald Ford renominated. They went through five people in order to try to stop Reagan. Now, thank God people like you all across America came together and made sure that he became president. And it wasn't easy for him. I got called out of the White House two or three times because in order to stop the ruinous inflation that Carter had started, in order to do that, he had to do tough things. He had to do things that were hard, hard for him to do. He was a very empathetic man. He loved people, but he knew what he had to do to turn this country around, and he was willing to do it no matter what. That's what we need in the way of people who are going to be going in to the state uh, legislature in this next session, and particularly the House. Now, Kasich and I have been good friends for a long time. And this state has never had the opportunity to have a governor and a speaker of the House who are both in favor of giving Ohio a Ronald Reagan administration. And that's what it's about. That's what this is going to be. I want to indicate to you that some of the candidates we have out there are going to be leaders for the future. And that's a great thing. And some of them are going to serve a short time because they want to fix things. And then they're going to go home, and that's a good thing. I want to mention a couple of them in particular. I started out uh, going across the southeast part of the state that used to be Republican. And uh, one of the first guys that we recruited was a uh, full bird colonel in the National Guard who was a flight surgeon and did three tours of Iraq. He also is a, a professor of medicine in Athens at the medical college there. He's a Republican County Chairman, 
and he's the county coroner. Now here this guy rolls this stuff out in front of me, and I said, I mean, I had to say it. I said, would you be willing to run? And he said to me, I think it's my duty. I think it's my duty. I'll never get over that, as long as I live. There was a man who had done all that for his country and for his local county, and I wanted to tell you the next step. That seat is Democrat, 44% Republican. He went out and started visiting with people. He had friends that went out and helped him doing the door-to-door. -door. He has friends today doing the door-to-door. -to -door. They have two kinds of shirts. The one says Colonel Johnson for state representative, and the other one says Democrats for Colonel Johnson. 350 Democrats going door-to-door -to, -door to Democrat doors and telling people why they need to elect this kind of man. The Democrat candidate is one of the people being investigated by the Inspector General for having, in effect, defrauded the state by the kind of uh, construction that was going on in school buildings down there. They fired uh, uh, Merle Shoemaker's son, who had run the thing for a number of years, entirely a man of integrity, so they didn't want him there anymore. The governor fired him, 